Lord. Well, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here in the house of the Lord with you to close our Lord's Day in worship. Uh, as uh, we uh, end our Lord's Day with worshiping together, before we're called to worship, I do want to remind you of a few announcements uh, of upcoming events here in the life of the church. Uh, first would be the uh, Children's Fall Festival this upcoming Wednesday night. Of course, dinner will be served at 5.30, uh, hamburgers and hot dogs, and then the children's festivities will begin at 6.30. We will uh, have adult prayer meeting at 6.30, so we hope that you'll join us for a great time of discipleship and fellowship. Uh, also, we announced our fall Bible conference that will be uh, taking place in two weeks, November 16th and 17th. Uh, we'll have a uh, fellowship dinner the 16th at 6 p.m. with a worship service to follow at 7. Uh, and then all day Sunday, our guest speaker, Sean Morris, will be preaching and teaching to us during the Sunday school hour at 10, the morning worship service at 11, and then the evening worship service at 6. And so we hope that you'll uh, make plans to attend. He's going to be preaching and teaching on the first four commandments uh, found in the law. And so it will be a a great time of learning uh, and worship for us. Uh, also, we announced this morning that the church is in need of a, uh, a trustee uh, that's here uh, in town and available. Uh, and so the session will be recommending uh, Mr. Talley McCall to serve as a church trustee. So next Sunday, after the morning worship service, we'll have a brief congregational meeting uh, to elect a new trustee for our church. Uh, please be in prayer for those men who were elected to serve as elders and deacons after our morning worship service this morning. You can see their names on the back of your bulletin. Uh, and also, uh, something that I failed to uh, announce this morning was the insert uh, for Christmas poinsettias uh, for the Christmas season. Um, if you would like to place an order uh, of a poinsettia given in memory or honor of someone, uh, please fill this out uh, and turn it in by November the 24th, November the 24th. Uh, and as we said this morning also, uh, the church will be open tomorrow and Tuesday all day long for uh, prayer. If you feel led to come and pray here uh, for the upcoming elections, uh, local, state, and federal, uh, you are more than welcome to come and to pray uh, here at uh, the church. Well, as we enter into worship, our God calls us to worship. Psalm 95 is our call to worship this, this evening. And so if you'll please stand as you're able uh, and let us enter into worship together. Psalm 95, reading verses 6 and 7. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of his hand. Well, as we uh, come into the courts together to praise and worship our great shepherd, as he leads us beside still waters and restores our soul, even leads us through the valley of the shadow of death all the way to glory, uh, let us take our hymn books in our hand and turn over to Psalm 105, Psalm 105C, and we are going to sing, O praise the Lord, his deeds make known. 105C, let's sing all five verses aloud together. Thank you. 
Let's pray. Lord, we do come tonight. Lord, we uh, still our hearts and uh, Lord, come to you through Christ. Come to you uh, the one way that anyone can come, but the glorious truth, the fact that sinful man can come to a holy God uh, without terror of only receiving judgment uh, is because of the Lord Jesus and that we can come and have a right understand, a right uh, standing, Lord, because of uh, the Lord Jesus and because of your giving of your son for us. So, Lord, we pray tonight that you graciously would help us. Lord, we know we need help. Uh, you teach that we can do nothing apart from you, and that includes we cannot worship rightly. We cannot uh, do anything, Lord, uh, without your grace. So we ask tonight that you would be with us, that you would strengthen us and, and accept our worship. Uh, be with Pastor Matt to preach. Be with us to listen and sing. Uh, for we ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, if you'd remain standing for our hymn of the month, we probably all know this hymn. So we don't? Okay. Oh, okay. We don't all know this hymn. Some of us do. It's a good one. Um, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, hymn number 463, um, a good, I believe, American kind of uh, gospel or southern uh, uh, spiritual song. So let's sing this together of God's love for us, 463. seated. Well, if you have your, uh, please make sure you have your bulletin out as we come now to our corporate affirmation of faith. And you, I'm sure, know uh, that the Westminster Cat Confession of Faith and the Westminster Larger and Shorter Catechism start off with the question, uh, what is 
uh, the chief end of man or the chief and sole end of man or greatest end. Uh, we'll hear the, about almost a century before in, uh, in Heidelberg, Germany, this uh, catechism and confession was made of uh, really the Reformed faith as well. And this first question is equally of importance. Um, did you see the question, what is our only comfort in life and death? And while I would uh, not only say that this doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, be concerned or do anything else, uh, that, for instance, this week we shouldn't all get out and vote. I don't think I have to tell anybody here that. Uh, but uh, our one certain hope that cannot change no matter what, that we are absolutely assured of, uh, is Jesus Christ and our faithful triune God and his promises to us. There's no way that can be thwarted, changed, or anything else like that. That is what cannot fail. So um, I will ask the question, and then together uh, let us answer the print in the bold. So, believer, what is thy only comfort in life and death? And the answer is that I, with body and soul, both in life and death, am not my own, but belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood hath fully satisfied for all my sins and delivered me from all the power of the devil, and so preserves me that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head, yea, that all things must be subservient to my salvation, and therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life, and makes me sincerely willing and ready henceforth to live unto him. Amen. All right, we are to uh, the singing of psalms and hymns, the congregational selection. So shout them out if you got one. 22D, Psalm 22, good, uh, a well-timed, fitting one about the, the fact of the matter is uh, again, it doesn't mean don't go out and vote. You do. But <laughs> uh, the Lord alone is God. Uh, 22D. Um, the ends of all the earth shall hear. Um, do we know this tune? Do you want to play the tune real quick? <laughs>
right, we have time for another one. 23? 23A. Okay, right next to it, if you don't have to turn, is the shortest you're ever going to have to turn. So, great one. Again, the Lord is our shepherd for believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, he is our shepherd always by our side through this life and the next. So, again, let's sing to our, I believe this is Crimin, we do know this. So, let's uh, sing this together. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Let us uh, return to our Lord in prayer again together uh, with the pastoral prayer. Father in heaven, you have been so merciful and gracious to us that you have bestowed on, upon us the Savior of sinners and the blessings of the benefits of his redemption from above. Lord, through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we enjoy our justification right now we enjoy the blessings of being sanctified by your word and spirit right now and we await the day lord that we are glorified and in your presence forever forever and the consummation of your kingdom where all the nations come to thee will be forever lord we are thankful that now and forever you have given us the chief shepherd the lord jesus christ and that he is with us no matter the circumstances of this life, whether it be in the valley of the shadow of death or whether it be resting in the greenest of pastures beside the still waters. Lord, you as our chief shepherd have got us and led us there. And Lord, we are a thankful people, thankful for the gospel of grace that has met us, thankful that you have redeemed us and declared us righteous, Thankful that you have adopted us in your family and made us co-heirs with our elder brother, Jesus. And we are the first to admit, Lord, and confess before you that we are those who are unworthy. And aside from your mercy and grace, we would be dead in our sins and our trespasses. But you have made us alive in Christ Jesus, given us the resurrection power of his resurrection and causing us to live in the kingdom of light, walking in the freedom of your commands. We are a people, Lord, who, yes, still struggle with our flesh, 
yes, still give in to temptation. We feel the burdens of the spiritual warfare that we are amid in the world, the flesh, and against the devil, Lord. But we are those who are victorious because we have been giving the living hope, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a thankful people coming in the name of the Lord, the one mediator between God and man, we come boldly before your throne of mercy, asking of those things in which we desire and those things in which we need. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless this church as we have been celebrating this year. You have been faithful to her for 125 years. You have grown her and you have sustained her. You have blessed her mightily, Lord, and we pray that we would see even more fruit of thy kingdom being advanced here. We pray for gospel success in our ministries. We pray for children to be brought up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord at the home and here at the church. We pray, Lord, that you would draw them to, unto yourself at an early age and that they would profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for sinners to be saved. Lord, we know that there are many within uh, maybe even our congregation, but certainly in our family and our friend groups that do not know thee as their personal Lord. And we pray that you would draw them unto yourself by your word and spirit and that you would change their hearts of stone, giving them hearts of flesh so that they might understand their sinfulness and that they might turn unto you. Lord, we pray for new church members as well. We thank you for the families that we have brought in the past couple of months. And yet, Lord, we desire to continue to see our church numerically grow, not that we might boast in any might of ourselves, but that we might boast in the work that you are doing here. Uh, and we pray, Lord, that we would see spiritual growth as well, that we would see uh, men and women and children, families being strengthened and sanctified, that we would see real progress in their walk with thee. And, and Lord, that we would really see a, a love throughout our congregation for the Lord's day for the fellowship of the believers, for the sacraments, for the preaching and reading of your word, for being in the courts of the Lord together. Lord, we pray that you would reveal yourself mightily here amongst us, and we pray that you would do so through the many turbulent circumstances that some of our members are facing. We, we know that there are members in our church having surgeries this week, we know that there are many even recovering from surgeries or falls. We know, Lord, that there are members of our church yearning for the salvation of their children and worrying about their mental state. And we pray, Lord, that you would be close to them by your spirit, that you would comfort them by the comforter, that you would give them courage and strength and patience and endurance and perseverance and prayerfulness as they deal with these valleys of life. And Lord, we know that you are working out uh, many blessings for our families. Not only are we seeing families growing, but we are seeing families strengthened, and we are seeing families committed unto thee, and we are seeing new elders and deacons being elected unanimously by the congregation, and we Know all, all these things, Lord, the unity that we experience, the growth that we experience. It's all a blessing from your hand. And so, Lord, let us be a thankful people for the work that you're doing here amongst us and amongst our households represented. Father, we do pray for our local municipality, our state, and our nation. Lord, these are polarizing political times here amongst us, and admittedly, Father, we are those who are anxious about the coming week, uh, and yet we pray that we would be reminded that you hold all things in your hands, and nothing happens apart from your sovereign will, that if you care so much for us that not a hair falls from our head without you preordaining it, Lord, you will be uh, gracious to your people uh, in preserving your church 
even if that means that the world around us is led by wicked, uh, perverted individuals. And yet your word tells us that no matter how wicked they might be, that we ought to pray for them and honor them. And also your word tells us that we ought to pray for good, godly leaders. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would put in political power those who seek to glorify you, who seek to work out for the good of this nation, this state, and this county. Lord, we pray that you would uh, put people in office who would fear the name of the Lord first and foremost, and yet they would execute justice also as prescribed in your word. We know, Lord, that you are the creator and sustainer and governor of all things, and no king or power or authority rises without your hand guiding them there, and yet also your hand can remove them. And so, Lord, we pray that if it be fit in your will to remove uh, those leaders within our representative republic and our state and our municipality, uh, those who do not honor you, those who do not want to work for the good of the people, that you would sovereignly move them out of the way if it be pleasing to thee. And so, Lord, may we trust all things uh, that will happen on the political landscape to you this week. May we commit to those things that we need to commit to, uh, prayerfulness and watchfulness, uh, and the practice of being good citizens here under our government. Uh, may, may we execute our duties faithfully, and may we uh, be Christians boldly, uh, no matter what might come. Father, we do pray for our time in the Scriptures. We pray that your Spirit would be imparted to us in abundance so that we might rightly understand your Word. We know that, Lord, it is you who opens our ears and opens our minds and opens our hearts to hear and to know and to receive this word. And so may we come humbly before you, longing to hear you speak and ready to take this word and apply it to our daily lives. Let us not be hearers only, but let us be doers of your word uh, so that all might know that we uh, walk in the power of the gospel. And so, Lord, may you continue to conform us more into the image of your Son, even in our uh, half an hour or so together in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And may your Son be honored and glorified and upheld uh, so that we might look to him and receive life and help everlasting. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, if you will, open your Bibles with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, our selected text for this evening is verses 15 through 18. Verses 15 through 18. Uh, you will remember if you've been with us the story so far that is being unfolded here in Paul's first letter to the churches of Corinth. He is walking through probably what many commentators uh what many commentators say is, is a list of questions that he has received by letter from the elders of Corinth, uh, and he is working through them systematically as he helps them navigate all of these church issues that are before them. Uh, and as we moved into chapter 9, we saw that the Apostle Paul's apostleship has been challenged yet again. Uh, mostly here in this chapter, it's been attacked because he refuses to take payment uh, for his preaching here amongst the people uh, in Corinth. Uh, we know something of the Greek sociology and ideology of the day. The orators that would come through and preach and teach uh, and speak and lecture in these cities, they would be paid by the well-established individuals and families within the city. Uh, but as payment back to their financial gifts, the, the orators, the preachers, the teachers, the lecturers would scratch the ears of those who had paid them. And so Paul says, so that I won't be held captive by any certain individual or any sect of any, any group here in the city of Corinth, I'm going to preach and I'm not going to take a dime from you. Um, and we said it wasn't just Paul being proud or Paul making a grandstand against the 
the uh, earthly powers that exist here in Corinth, but he's really executing, we might would even say embodying, the principle that he taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And if you remember, as Pastor Don preached that chapter for us a number of weeks ago now, Paul said there are some times in the Christian life where we have the freedom or the liberty to do something, but because of the weaker brother or sister that might be influenced and led astray by our actions, certain liberties will be restricted even in our own life. And we'll have to constrain our liberties and not practice them so that we won't cause uh, our brothers and sisters in Jesus to stumble. And so Paul rightly said, I have the liberty to take payment. I have the freedom in Christ to be paid for my labors amongst you as I've been planting churches, as I have been preaching and teaching and administering the sacraments. In fact, what he says, it is good for those who preach and teach and administer the sacraments in the church, i.e. the ministers, to be paid by that household of faith. But so I won't cause anyone to stumble in my time here in Corinth. I am not going to, I am not going to take payment. I am not going to receive uh, the, the portion that is due unto me. So I'm going to make tents uh, on the side so that I might make my living and I'm going to preach and teach and plant churches for free. And, and here in verses 15 through 18, Paul continues to explain why he has adopted this policy and strategy towards the Corinthian believers. And, and as he does, he very helpfully and pastorally gives us some snippets of the nature and the methods uh, of Christian ministry. And so for tonight and Lord willing next week, that's what will be focused on, the nature and the methods of Christian ministry. And so with our uh, hearts ready to hear God's word, let us read verses 15 through 18, and then we'll spend time uh, in its exposition together. But I have made no use of any of these rights, nor am I writing these things to secure any such provision. For I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of my ground for boasting. For if I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward but if not on my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? That in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for it. In seminary, uh, I took a church planting and a revitalization class, and it was led by a gentleman named Dr. Alan Avra, who was working at the time for an evangelism curriculum called Christianity Explored. Uh, maybe you've heard of that curriculum before. It's quite good uh, for the purposes of evangelism, bringing people into the church. But that curriculum opens up with a story of a social experiment conducted by a London newspaper. The newspaper paid this one gentleman to stand outside of a station there in Oxford, right in the center of London, one of the busiest shopping centers in all of Europe, and he was simply to offer them leaflets, and on each leaflet uh, was the directions that if you would simply take this leaflet back to the person who gave it to you, you would receive five pounds, no strings attached. Um, and he handed out these leaflets in this bustling street, uh, this busy shopping center for roughly about three hours. And each leaflet said the same exact thing. You bring it back to the one who gave it to you and you will receive five pounds or five dollars, as we say uh, here in America. And he handed out what he... Uh, what he suggested to the London newspaper, somewhere around 3,000 to 4,000 leaflets in three hours. So roughly 1,000 to 1,500 leaflets in three hours. And so they thought, boy, we just spent a lot of money on this social experiment. 
And the story goes that the young man started laughing and he said, no, you only spent 55 pounds. Only 11 people came back to receive the money. And, and that, that actually was quite shocking to me. That out of 3,000 to 4,000 people, only 11 came back to receive the money that was promised to them, no strings attached. And so the story goes that the young man went back out into the city square and he found a portion of those people who did not come to receive the money and he simply started asking them, why did you not come back? Why did you not read the instructions and come back? Did you not read the leaflet? And many of them said, yes, I read the leaflet. Well, why didn't you come back? And each and every one of them said, you know, nothing's ever free. Uh, we've said that before, right? Nothing's ever free. Even good deeds don't go unpunished, we often say. Uh, and that's what's so shocking about the gospel, I think. That eternal life is rewarded completely and utterly free for us because of the Lord Jesus Christ, His person and His work. And Paul's whole approach to ministry as he is describing it here in verses 15 through 18, his whole approach to Christian ministry is designed so that people might know that there is a free offer of salvation preached and proclaimed unto them through the gospel. Through the gospel. And so the first thing I want you to notice is something of the content of Paul's ministry. What is he preaching? What is he teaching? His labors are all for what here? As he labored amidst the, the Corinthian believers, he says there in verses 15 through 18 that it was for the gospel. It was for the free offer of the gospel. Did you notice how many times he actually referenced the gospel there in verses 15 through 18? Specifically, he repeats it often in verses 16 through 18. He says, if I preach the gospel, that is my grounds for boasting. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. What is my reward that I preach the gospel? What? Free of charge. The whole content of Paul's ministry here amongst the Corinthian church as he looks back upon it and begins to talk about his apostleship and his ministry, he says the, the entire content of my time with you, my whole purpose amongst you, was to preach the free offer of the gospel, and I did it free of charge so that you might know that it is utterly free. It is completely free. And that lends us to, to begin asking a question, what is the purpose of church ministers? What is the purpose of church ministries? I mean, if you just simply think about the ministry of Pastor Don and myself here in the local congregation. We are shepherds of the flock. We pastor and we care for the people. We teach and we train and we disciple. We lead in the affairs of the congregations. We, we counsel. We're administrators. All of these things are true. But the number one priority, Paul is saying, for the minister in the local church is to proclaim the gospel of God. That is the burden of a faithful ministry. It's not as if Paul did not do many other things as he worked amongst the Corinthian believers. It's not that he did not counsel. It's not that he did not resolve congregational conflict. It's not that he did not go out and evangelize. It's not that he did not disciple or train future elders and deacons to serve these congregations after he departs. But he says, my chief end amongst you was to preach the gospel. And Paul's quite emphatic about it, isn't he? He talks as if in verses 15 through 18 that his whole life amongst the Corinthian believers was entirely determined by his passionate commitment to deliver the gospel message. He said, every other concern that I had amongst you paled in comparison to my chief end to preach the gospel. Because Paul is convinced that there is an urgency in the gospel. 
You see, Paul understands that the news he carried of the free offer of grace and mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ was so vital and so urgent, so necessary that he would, he would surrender everything, including his own payment. He would give up his rights. He would cast away his freedoms. He would endure the cost to make the gospel known. And quite frankly, we just do not see this passion or this commitment we do not see this urgency of the gospel coming from many of the ministries of the church. Not just this church, but the Church of America, we might say. Our own denomination, other denominations here in the United States. And I think that often it's because when we struggle to have an urgency to share the gospel and to keep the gospel central, it's, it's because we've lost sight of how compelling and and gracious, and urgent, and pressing, and necessary, and free that the gospel really is. You know, oftentimes we've heard the gospel so often in the church ministries, in our homes, in our own Bible readings, that it almost becomes something of a piece of family heirloom silver that, that sits on a bookcase, and it tarnishes, and it dulls because quite frankly, we just don't do anything with it. And and, and the picture there is that it's time to shine up the piece of silver. It's time to polish it so that it might luster and, and captivate our attention yet again. Because it's the gospel that has taken us as lost and helpless, condemned people, and through Christ we are now free, found, justified, The Lord has sent us His Son, Jesus Christ, to live the life that we could not live and fulfill the law in our place, dying a death that we deserve, paying perfectly the price of satisfying God's wrath at the cross instead of us. And the gospel message, of course, is that we, if we would just simply, as we sang in Psalm 22, if we would just bend a knee to King Jesus, all of the blessings and benefits of our salvation might be ours in Him. You know, he is the king and the head of the church. He is the one who is building his kingdom. He is the one who has brought us from death to life, from darkness to light, from our state of sin and misery into a state of grace and glory. He has declared us righteous despite our continued unfaithfulness. And he has made us co-heirs with our elder brother Jesus, giving us the right to reign in the new heavens and the new earth forever. We have all the rights and privileges of a child of God. We are simply, as Jesus tells Nicodemus in John chapter 3, we are born again to a new and a living hope. And it's time, again, for the gospel to be electric for us. It's time again for the gospel to sparkle and shine amongst us Yes, you know, we might have the the lisping and the stuttering and the stammering tongues. But Paul says the proper response of any believer is to share the gospel of God. Because there is an urgency in doing so. You know, we cast all of our hope and all of our affections upon so many worldly things. As the cultural times wax and wane, we try to find political pundits or political platforms, to to cast all of our eggs into their basket. We, We simply try to take opportunities that the world offers to change things, but nothing will be changed and nothing will fulfill and nothing will save like the gospel of God that Jesus saves sinners. Not that any of those things aren't important. I understand that. But if we really want to see our church and our community and our nation change, we cannot put our confidence in any other thing but the gospel. And that really is what drives Paul's ministry. Not only is the gospel the content of his ministry, but the gospel drives his ministry. If you look back at verses 16 and 17, he says, If I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting... For necessity is laid upon me, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. 
For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. And that stewardship there is the key word of that particular phrase. Because Paul tells us what a steward is. If you'll keep your finger there at chapter 9, flip over back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We handled chapter 4 now many, many weeks ago. But remember that Paul has talked about how the apostles are stewards of the mystery of God. He says, this is how one should regard us in verse 1 of chapter 4. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself. But I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. And so what is Paul saying? What is a steward? As he talks about it here in the context of 1 Corinthians, he is saying simply that a steward is a servant. We might would even say better that the steward is a slave serving in the house, managing what has been entrusted to him by the master. That's a steward. And Paul's saying that's exactly what he is. I am a slave and the master is Jesus. Therefore, the compulsive nature of my ministry is to preach the gospel because that is what God has told me to preach. And what he says in chapter 4 is that when I preach, I really don't care if you judge me. And I really don't care if I'm tickling my own ears by what I'm saying. If I'm glorifying the Lord, he is the one who judges. Therefore, as he is the one who has commissioned me, I must preach. I must serve in honor of Him and in Him alone. You see what he's saying here in the text is that it's the Lord Jesus who has laid upon Him, who has commissioned Him to preach the gospel. That is what drives the Apostle Paul's ministry. In fact, what he says here is pretty telling for us how emphatically he believes that he is commissioned by the Lord Jesus to preach the gospel because he says... Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And that's strong language. It's equally as strong as what the Apostle Paul says in Romans when he begins to talk about election. I would rather me be cut off from the Lord than this be true, he is saying. The same thing is being said here. If I do not preach the gospel, I desire to have God's judgment upon me. It should rain down upon me if I do not do what the Lord Jesus has commissioned me to do. You see, what Paul's saying here is that I can do nothing else but preach the gospel because that is the calling upon my life by my master, Jesus. And, and you know, as, yeah, as, I, I, as I look across the, the evangelical landscape of the day, uh, even as I find myself in uh, seminary classrooms listening to different Masters of Divinity students talk to and fro about all the grand ideas that they have for the church, and yet they've never stepped foot in a church to do any sort of ministry. I'm convinced that, that what we need most in the church is, is pastors who would say, I can do nothing else and be nothing else but stewards of the Word of God. You know, it, it is, uh, quite frankly, it, it is, it's nauseating to think about how many ministers want to go into uh, different churches with these church growth models or plans to revitalize or mission statements that would transform or, you know, we have all of these gimmicks and, and consultants and, and all of these things brothers and sisters, if we're going to see the church flourish in this evil day, what we need is a bunch of pastors who will say, necessity is laid upon me, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel of God. And without that sense of obligation, it's no surprise that when pastors feel the pressure 
of church conflict or when their new gimmicky trend does not work in small town Georgia or Tennessee that they just simply walk away from the church and from ministry altogether. You see, the church is facing many men who quote-unquote feel called to ministry but do not feel called to preach the gospel of God. And the driving force behind ministers' hearts ought to be and has to be, Paul says, to preach the gospel. And as he talks about what drives him in ministry, he lastly talks about what is his payment for his ministry. What is his payment for his ministry? And that might confuse you a little bit because we've already said that Paul isn't taking any payment for his ministry here in Corinth. As he labored amongst them, he did not take a single dime for any, from any church or from any believer. He simply made tents in the streets all day so that he might preach and teach at night. So what do I mean by his payment for ministry? Well, he talks about it there in verses 6, 15 and 16. First he says, I'm not writing this to you so that you might catch up on your payment. Notice that he's saying that. Have you ever received a, a letter or you've been talking to someone? It's like, oh yeah, you didn't pay me or, or you didn't you know, give me what I thought I deserved. And it's okay, wink, wink. Um, you know, trying to guilt trip you into, into giving you some sort of payment for your duty. That's not what Paul's doing. He's, he's not saying that you owe me now that I've left you, now that you've seen how I did all of this for free, now you should send an offering unto me to pay me for my labors. No, he says, I'd rather die than take any payment from you because the gospel of God itself is my ground for boasting. The gospel of God itself is my ground for boasting. And, and that is not any sort of humble brag by the Apostle Paul. What he's pointing to here is how successful the gospel was amongst the Corinthians. He's already told them, hasn't he, that many of you were not of much worth according to society, but now you are heirs with Christ Jesus. He has talked about the effectiveness that the gospel had amongst the communities here in the Corinth region, amongst the Corinthian people. And he said, when I look at how successful the gospel has been, that is my grounds of boasting. That is my payment. And he's not pointing at what he has done. He's not pointing to the success of his ministry, saying like many cheap televangelists today, I've led, you know, so and so many to Christ this day. One of my biggest pet peeves is when evangelists move around our county and surrounding counties and all they can put on Facebook pages, how many they supposedly led to Christ. He didn't lead anybody to Christ. You know, let me go ahead and put that out there. The Holy Spirit is the one who drew them to Christ. Let us give thanks for what he has done and boast in what the Lord has done. That is Paul, the Apostle Paul's payment. He says in 2 Corinthians that the that the boasting that he does is boasting in his own weakness so that compared to his weakness, the glory of God might become that much more. He says, my reward is that the gospel went out free of charge and it did a good work. And it did a good work. And so what you hear here is the confidence that Paul has in the gospel you hear the confidence that God has, or Paul has in the gospel of God. And if we would examine our hearts, I think this is where we need to land. If we would examine our hearts, not only do we need to say, you know, do I have a real passion to see the gospel go forth? Not only do I not leave the gospel on the shelf becoming lackluster, but I find it as exciting and powerful, so much so that I'm bubbling over to tell the good news of great joy to all people. Not only do we need to, to examine ourselves on that, but we also need to examine ourselves on our confidence in the gospel. You know, sometimes the actions that we do not take, meaning our lack of telling one another 
about the Lord Jesus and our neighbors and our friends and those who we cross paths with on a daily basis. The reason why we hide Christ from our lips and the gospel from our lives is because, quite frankly, we just don't have the confidence that it's going to do anything. And we need to have a confidence that the gospel is what we need. We don't need a silver bullet. We don't need the gimmicks or the tricks. We don't need new fads or fashions. We just need to simply embrace the gospel. You know, it's Martin Luther who said during the Reformation, I didn't do a thing. I preached the gospel, then I went and had drinks with my friend Philip, and then I went to sleep. The word did all the work. And do you have confidence that the word will do the work? That is what we need to have, a confidence that the Word will do the work, that the Word will open blind eyes, unstop deaf ears, change hearts of stones to heart of flesh, so that we might really see an advancement of the kingdom. And may we boast in what the Lord might do through His Word and by His Spirit. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for an opportunity to come to your word, and we pray, O Lord, that it would convict where it ought to convict, encourage where it ought to encourage. Let us examine our hearts. And let us see if the gospel still excites us spiritually even this night. Maybe we treat the gospel like that family heirloom that is collecting dust and lackluster. May it shine yet again so that we might be set ablaze for gospel purposes. And may we have a great confidence in the gospel that as it goes out from us, it does not return to us void. That the eternal Sufficient word of God will do the work that you have designed for it to do. And so let us boast in what you are doing in and through us. And may we just see it and rejoice in it. In Christ's name we pray these things. Amen. Well, of course, uh, after the benediction, we will sing together the first stanza of Psalm 117, which is to the tune of all creatures of our God and King. And now stand and receive the Lord's blessings. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit now until we reach heaven. Amen. Amen.